Hi, I uh, just wanted to share a few facts about radiation, things I think every citizen needs to know, uh, especially in light of recent events. And uh, a lot of what I'm going to talk about here you may not have thought about since high school chemistry, but uh, if you cast back in your memory, I'll be explaining things pretty well, and I think uh, you'll gain a lot of understanding from it. So let's get started. First of all, you want to make sure that the, uh, the person presenting this type of information is not a total lunatic. Uh, without going line by line, you can see there that I do have a background in weapons of mass destruction, toxic agent training. I am a um, former nuclear, biological, and chemical officer with the U.S. Army. So I have dealt with this kind of thing before. You hear a lot of buzzwords in the media uh, these days, gamma rays, dirty bomb, uranium, radiation, fallout, uh, weapon of mass destruction, nuclear, these kinds of things. Uh, I Personally, I think the media is overusing terms without defining them very well because an afraid population pays more attention and their ratings go up. Uh, hopefully I can help you understand them in just a little bit better so that when they use these terms you understand what's important, what's not, what's a fear tactic, and what is real information. So there are three basic types of nuclear radiation. Uh, there's alpha radiation, which is basically a helium nucleus, two protons and two electrons. You have beta radiation, uh, beta plus or beta minus, basically an electron or a positron. And then you have gamma radiation, which is a high energy photon. Uh, it's actually identical to light, it's just higher up, um, higher in energy level on the electromagnetic magnetic spectrum. So radioactive decay occurs in the nucleus of an atom. All radioactive decay occurs in, in the nucleus. That's the nuclear in nuclear radiation. So you've got your nucleus, which consists of protons and neutrons, and then you've got your electrons surrounding it in the cloud. <clears throat> and there are 92 naturally occurring ele elements. Uranium is the heaviest of these. Now each is made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Okay, so if uranium is atomic number 92, where does the 238 come, come from? That's the atomic weight. It's derived from the total number of protons and neutrons. For all intents and purposes, they have the same weight, and so they use the same calculation. You just sum them up, and that's, that's the atomic weight. So elements with the same atomic number but different atomic weights are called isotopes. For example, uranium-236 has two less neutrons than uranium-238. Here's a quick look at the periodic table. As you can see further down on the table, uh, uranium number 92 is the heaviest. All of the grayed out elements that occur after that are actually man-made elements synthesized by radioactive decay in a laboratory, and we'll get into that in a little more detail later. So in radioactive decay, certain isotopes are radioactive. Um, okay. So carbon-12 is normal carbon, while carbon-14 is a radioactive isotope. You don't, ha not necessarily all isotopes are going to be radioactive. Uh, but however, for many heavier elements such as uranium or plutonium, all isotopes are going to be radioactive. And certain elements like plutonium, as I discussed before, are only created by radioactive decay. They do not exist in nature. They have to be synthesized by radioactive decay in a laboratory. And so this example here, we have uranium-235, which undergoes a beta minus decay to neptunium-235, undergoing another beta minus decay to plutonium-235. And what that means, essentially, is that every time a, an electron leaves the nucleus of an atom, it turns a neutron into, or it, it turns a neutron into a proton and emits an electron that's now free in the atmosphere and flying around. So that's how you synthesize, it greatly simplified of course, but that's how you simplify, synth synthesize a, um, a new element in a lab. <clears throat> now let's get into alpha radiation. Okay, a, a helium atom's nucleus, which is uh, two protons and two neutrons, it's a positive, positively charged particle, uh, he HE plus two. <clears throat> yeah, that, that is an alpha particle. Now, in this example here, a heavier, heavy radioactive atoms such as uranium-238 will give off that alpha particle, okay? And when it gives off that alpha particle, it then becomes a slightly lighter element. It, in this case, it went from uranium-238 to thorium-234. Now, that alpha radiation has certain characteristics. In, in nuclear terms, two protons and two electrons are pretty heavy. Uh, they don't, it doesn't travel very far. Alpha radiation can't penetrate your skin or your clothing. It'll be halted by the dermal layer of your skin. 
Uh, it can cause a minor burn if it sits there, but it can't penetrate deeper into your body or anything like that. It can be stopped by something as simple as a piece of paper. Okay, um, alpha emitting particles can be harmful if they are inhaled, swallowed, or absorbed through open wounds, but again, it's going to be kept off your skin by clothing. Okay, and, and it only travels a very short distance through the air, two to three inches. So if you are two blocks away from a, a dirty bomb explosion, uh, you're, you're going to be safe from alpha radiation. That's not to say you won't be safe from other types, but we'll get into that in a moment. Beta radiation is a high energy electron or positron emitted from the nucleus of an atom. So in this case, um, the uranium-238 gives off a beta particle. So here we have uranium-236 gives off that beta minus particle and that atom decays into neptunium-237. It's, it's called decay even though the number goes up. Um, it's just the way it works. Beta radiation may travel several meters in air and is moder moderately penetrating. Okay, so it goes a little bit further than alpha radiation does. It can penetrate human skin to the germinal layer where new skin cells are produced and prolonged exposure can cause burns. So clothing will still provide some protection, however it is a little bit more penetrating than alpha radiation and it's harmful if it's deposited internally by like breathing or swallowing. And then we get into gamma radiation. This is the radiation that most people are talking about in the media when things like uh, reactors melt down or we're afraid of a nuclear explosion or that sort of thing. Uh, gamma radiation is a high energy photon. It's like light or radio waves. Now, no actual radioactive decay must happen in order for gamma radiation to be emitted. What you do have to have is a lot of energy supplied to an atom for example, in this case, let's call it nickel-60, uh, emits a gamma photon in order to jump down to a more stable state. It's, it's received such an influx of energy through other means, be it uh, nuclear fission, nuclear fusion, uh, that sort of thing, and, and it's, it's in a very excited state, and in order to stabilize, it has to emit gamma radiation. So there it emits the gamma radiation. Okay. Uh, it often accompanies alpha and beta radiation, but it doesn't have to. So you can have a normal radioactive decay. In this case, let's say americium-241, uh, we have a, um, a, an alpha particle emitted and simultaneously a gamma, a gamma ray is emitted from the americium-241. And that americium then decays to neptunium-237. So, and, nept and that actually that daughter nucleus, neptunium-237, can emit that gamma ray as well because it's still potentially in a very excited state. As we discussed, it is produced via nuclear fission. So in nuclear fission, what you have is an, is an implosion reaction. In this case, we have uranium-238, which undergoes implosion from external uh, explosive sources. It's a uniform compression inward, so it takes it all and compresses it to a pinpoint and then as it returns to its normal state it flies to pieces and gamma rays are emitted along with the various atomic particles that are generated as a result of the fission. So when in fission you're literally splitting the nucleus of a very heavy atom like uranium or plutonium. Now you have also a type of radiation called neutron induced gamma activity. So in, in the previous example you had a fission reaction where uranium-238 split into many different particles. If you create free neutrons with this process, what will happen is those neutrons have to have somewhere to go. So they will fuse with an atom in the environment, one that wasn't part of the explosion necessarily, and they create a new, a, a new isotope in an excited state that now emits gamma radiation in order to essentially settle down. So in this case, strontium-90 gets a neutron from fission reaction that pops in and it becomes one, one atomic weight heavier. It's now strontium-91, and it gives off gamma radiation in the environment. Now, important things to notice about gamma radiation, number one is it's not matter. It, it cannot be stopped by a piece of paper. It can't be stopped by clothing. It won't even really be stopped by your skin. Gamma rays have very high frequency and very low wavelength. They're on the opposite end of the electromagnetic spectrum from infrared radiation. It is the most energetic form of radiation on the spectrum. It's extremely ionizing. 
and it can travel many meters in air and many centimeters in human tissue. So it can penetrate deeply into your body and affect. Um, it can affect elements in your in your bones, in your DNA, in the cells in your body. It can it can do a lot. Now, radioactive materials that emit gamma radiation constitute both an external and internal hazard. Okay, they're detectable with survey instruments, including civil defense instruments. And as we said, alpha and beta, radi beta radiation frequently accompany gamma. Uh, instruments designed for detecting alpha and beta, though, will not detect gamma. You need separate detection instruments. Uh, a little bit about fallout. We haven't really been talking about um, you know, actual nuclear thermonuclear explosions. But um, just a little bit about it, you know, uh, fallout gets a lot of hype because no, a lot of folks aren't exactly sure what it is. But what, it, what fallout really is is particles of matter in the environment, in the, in the area around the explosion that are drawn into the explosion by, um, by the influx of air that fuels the combustion. And those particles become radioactive and are drawn up into the cloud and then they get named so because they literally fall out of the atmosphere after the explosion. They can drift hundreds or even thousands of miles downwind and then fall out of the atmosphere and contaminate an environment. So a nuclear device detonates on or near ground level. Large amounts of earth, water, vegetation, building material all that are vaporized and drawn up into the cloud. Uh, this classic mushroom cloud look. Okay, it's drawn into the cloud as oxygen is rushed into the explosion to fuel the fireball. Uh, it's much dirtier than an air burst, so if a nuclear bomb goes off in the air, higher up in the atmosphere, you don't really have any fallout. You have the actual radiation from the explosion itself, but no fallout. And as we said, the fallout can travel long distances on prevailing winds. A uh, little bit about radiation poisoning. Uh, damage to organ tissue by excessive exposure to ionizing radiation. Again, we're talking here about gamma radiation. Uh, generally refers to large doses in short-term exposure, and it's called acute radiation syndrome. Chronic can exist, but it's pretty uncommon. This is more of the effect of long-term low-dose exposure. A lot of this can happen to nuclear workers, but the average citizen really won't see too much exposure to chronic radiation syndrome. Uh, the main symptoms are going to be nausea and vomiting. Uh, headache, fatigue, and weakness can also accompany this. Uh, and the symptoms appear sooner with higher doses. Uh, in more severe exposure, a few symptom-free days may occur before the onset of more serious symptoms like fever, hair loss, bloody vomit, it's, and poor wound healing, that sort of thing. It seems counterintuitive, but uh, for whatever reason, symptom-free days will occur with higher doses. So your initial symptoms will go away, you'll, you'll start to feel fine, and then more serious symptoms can, can occur. Um, a little bit about radiation and cancer. Uh, cancer is generally caused when ionizing radiation affects the genes of the DNA. Uh, the speed, prognosis, degree of pain, etc. is not a function of the dose of radiation you've received, however. It's a, it's a function of the probability that effects will develop. And it is, once again, caused by gamma radiation. So protection measures from radiation incidents. Uh, you know, you're going to want to seek medical attention, of course, duh. Uh, if in, you're in the immediate area, cover your mouth and nose to avoid inhalation because, you know, again, that alpha and beta radiation isn't going to do a lot in the atmosphere to you, but if you inhale it, it can be a lot more damaging. Uh, wash thoroughly, and if you're wearing layers, remove and discard the outer clothing layer. Uh, that will, if radioactive material clings to you and emits gamma radiation, it, it can cause a lot more damage than just the environment can. And worse, you'll carry it with you. So if you can discard that outer clothing layer, by all means do. A lot of attention in the media lately has been, has been paid to um, potassium iodide as a countermeasure for radiation. Um, in, in my mind, this gets a little bit overhyped because it's useful in certain specific cases. In this case, for the prevention of thyroid cancer only, and um, the reason is that iodine-131 is a very common byproduct of fission and when your body, when you take in iodine into your body, the thyroid is one of the first places it goes. And so if you take potassium iodide tablets in advance of radiation exposure, 
you'll saturate your thyroid, preventing the radioactive iodine from being absorbed. And that doesn't protect it from the other parts of the body, however, and you do need to know about it well in advance and have saturated your thyroid already. Now, there are side effects. I would encourage you to look them up. I don't really have time to talk about them here, but you know, you don't want to just take potassium iodide all day, every day, because there are side effects as well. And if you're interested in some further reading, here are a couple of links. Um, I hope this was helpful, and I look forward to talking again.